Okay, so we have been discussing 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we are now into this last uh, uh, section of it. It's a fairly long chapter. In the book of Corinthians, the first four chapters had to do with the divisions in the church. We spent a long time on that. The, uh, and then five and six had to do with lack of discipline in the church, three different topics under that. And those were, uh, those were all under the category of conditions reported to Paul, things that were going on in Corinth, somebody had told him about, and he's addressing. So then beginning in chapter 7, uh, in verse 1, it talks about things, the questions that they had asked. And the rest of the book, until his final closing, is basically Paul answering questions that they had. Maybe not the kind of answers they expected, but he is answering them. And so we've had, uh, chapter 7 is questions about marriage. And uh, let's see here. What do I want to say here? Okay, I'm going to, I have some notes in here, but today there's one last question on marriage. Now concerning virgins, it says in verse 25. And uh, so there's a new, uh, a new wrinkle on the, the question about what to, what to do about marriage. Um, so I have a couple of quotes here. The first one comes from Tom Constable. I have them in your notes, so I didn't put them on the screen. And I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time reading this introductory material. So the second occurrence of the phrase "peri day" now concerning occurs in verse 25 and indicates another subject about which the Corinthians had written uh, to Paul. This was a subject of single women. The section, this section belongs with the rest of chapter 7 because this subject relates closely to what immediately precedes. Paul continued to deal with questions about marriage that the asceticism of some of the Corinthians raised. I want to key on that word, asceticism. The, uh, this, this is, we talked about this, uh, I think, two weeks ago uh, uh, in more detail. Uh, last week we were dealing with the questions regarding divorce and remarriage and trying to sort through everything that Paul is saying on that. Now I put in the notes here a scenario some suggest that lies behind this question is Christian fathers in Corinth who wonder whether they should give their daughters in marriage. So you see, you will see this down in verse 36 and 38. You may recall from our scripture reading. Some are urging asceticism. Okay, so asceticism is self-denial. So the idea that uh, because some of them were looking, uh, per perhaps retraining the Greek idea that the body is evil and that therefore everything connected with this is evil. And uh, this is not the teaching of the scripture. There is a proper and right and holy uh, expression of, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the marriage um, uh, uh, activity, but it's all within marriage. And it's, all, it's never... Uh, something that is, uh, in, the Bible never encourages any kind of withholding yourself from that unless you're not married. All right, so that's, that's the issue. So some are urging asceticism, and so they're saying, don't even give your daughters in marriage. There, there are also, I think I have a verb disagreement, should be, there are also some other concerns in the background, but there is also, what good grammar. Uh, okay, so what should they do? Note, other suggestions seem less plausible to me. There are some other suggestions that are made about the, what's prompting this. But I think to me, given the context that they were talking about, some people were even married people were saying, no, we should, with, we, we should abstain. It's more holy to do so. That's the scenario we get as we enter into the chapter. So Paul's saying, no, that's, that's not the right scenario. He's trying to give them a biblical perspective of both marriage and of singleness. Uh, he's, he wants them to have a balanced uh, way of looking at it. So there are four paragraphs in this section, and we're going to go paragraph by paragraph. In our uh, Deuteronomy study, we've been um, uh, doing this, and I've been reading through the paragraph and getting people to give the themes. Now, we're going to go one paragraph at a time in this study today. So let's uh, go ahead and read this paragraph again, verse 25 to 31, and then I'll get you to tell me uh, what the theme of this paragraph is, basically. So, now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I have an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. 
I think then that this is good in view of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have troubles in this life, and I am trying to spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened, that so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it, for the form of this world is passing away. All right, now it might be a little bit hard to put all of that under one heading, but what would you say is a general theme or question that's behind uh, this first, this part of Paul's answer. Anybody want to uh, take a stab at that? Don't pollute yourself with the world. All right, that's part of it. Okay, that's part of it. Anything else? Remember the the overall question about um, that, that there, he's dealing with in the chapter is the question of marriage. So how would we relate this to marriage? Anybody, Marlene? Okay, consecration. Okay, well that's part of it. It's not quite what I'm looking for. You don't have what I have in my notes, so that's why I keep asking. <laughs> not that my my notes are infallible, but I'm trying to help uh, with this. Uh, who is who is uh, who is asking the question here in this in this section? Well, the apostle is, but behind this, what question? What party in the church in Corinth? What group? What type of people are wondering what they should do? Not unbelievers, no. Okay, let's key in then on, um, pardon me? Virgins, okay, the virgins, the unmarried, okay? All right, so the question is, should we marry or not marry? Now, he adds in other things in the text, and all the things you are hitting on are correct. They're all around that, but he, it's, the underlying question is, should, well, I put in my note, should young peri- people marry at all? Maybe I should just say, simply say, should people marry at all? That's the question. You know, yes, uh, James. Uh, well, I was just a quick clarification. Okay. Right? Uh, well, we'll get to that passage in just a bit, but quickly, it is a, uh, in most cultures in the world, uh, the, there is, uh, the sense that, that the father is the authority. And so uh, when, and in, even in our ceremony, we, we tend, we have a giving of the bride. So somebody gives the bride. And typically, the idea is that the father agrees to this. And she is transferred from his authority to the husband's authority. Or maybe not authority. That might be too harsh of a word, but at least headship. Uh, and uh, now, obviously, there are circumstances that are different in certain cases, but that's the picture. Okay, so... So, um, um, uh, w- our culture has been radically changed from the culture of uh, even, well, how shall we put it, like even 50 years ago. Like there, there, uh, but, but if you go back into the, uh, if you think about the culture of the West, uh, you know, I think, and, I, and I, I don't know what it's like in Africa or Asia or anything like that, but I'm thinking my heritage is British and European, and in that culture, you know, the man had to come with hat in hand and you know, to the father, and he had to prove he could take care of her and and so forth before the father would agree. And the father had to agree. Okay, that that was the bottom line. Now you're nodding your head. Is that the way things are in Africa? Okay, so so that and I think that is we're going to get we're getting off we're getting off. So we're these aren't in the notes. Okay, don't worry about it. Okay, but but there is a certain naturalness. In a sense, nature teaches us this. Uh, 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 on average, men are stronger. Their role in life is to protect their women folk. Now, not all men do it. Some men are are, are terrible sinners and they abuse their women folk. That's a terrible thing. But in but in nature, the men are stronger and and it and they have an instinct to protect. Their wives, their daughters, and so so nature teaches this. I mean, God teaches it too, but it is it is a part of I think a biblical worldview. And um, you know, we provide. We we want to provide for our wives or our children, 
And it, 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 is, it is instinctive. I think God made us this way. Anyway, so we're getting off. Let's get back to our questions. Okay, so what terms in the following verses point to another concern that lies behind Paul's advice in this section? So there's several terms that seem to be related. So verse 26, I wonder if you can see the term that I'm pointing to. Anybody have an idea? What am I thinking about in verse 26? You might compare it to the next one, which is verse 28. Remain? No, that's not the one. Yes. Okay. 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 You're you're heading towards the right direction. So he's saying the things that the people who are not are not married think of the, uh, are married think of the things of the world. Uh, those who are not married think of the things of God. Now there's a reason for that. The re, there is a reason in particular that Paul is stressing makes him want them to think marriage over. So Lee. Okay, incoming or upcoming persecution. So what terms would relate to that in verse 26? Yeah, the present distress is what he says. All right, a crisis. All right, so, and then verse 28, there's a similar term. Trouble. You will have trouble in this wife. And then also, I'm trying to spare you. Okay? And then in verse 29, what else? What other term does he use? Pardon me? No, not that one, but we're talking about the trouble. So what's what's the similar term in verse 29? Uh, Pardon me? The time is shortened. All right, so what does that indicate? Let's talk about the time is shortened. What time does he mean? What do you think he's thinking about? Before the Lord comes back. So the end of time. All right, so there is a sense, even like there are only, this is... Uh, Oh, in the 50s uh, A.D., the Lord has been gone for 20 years. And even in that era, there's an anticipation he could come back today. All right? So he's saying, there's much to do. There's a present distress. The time is short. There's much to do. So we need to think about this. Okay? Now, uh, so what is Paul's concern? Uh this is, I think this question is too vague. Let's skip that one. Okay. When Paul says he has no command of the Lord, how does that affect the advice he is offering in verse 25? Verse 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. So what does, what are we to make about his words that follow? Right, right. okay, that's right. So he's appealing to his apostleship. He has not been, in other words, God has not directly revealed something here to him. Uh, Jesus didn't say anything in any of his sayings that would touch on this. So Paul is giving a judgment based on his position. All right, Lee? That's right, that's right. That's the secondary thing that we want to say because it's in the Bible. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is the Word of God. And it's a key thing for us to understand that the apostles have become the spokesmen of God. Now, nobody else is. This is, this is a little side note from, our, from what we're talking about. But we, can't, we don't have apostles today because only apostles speak for God. And when the, when the apostles died, those who were directly appointed by God, they did not appoint successors. All right, Tola. No, he's not. No, he's not. He's he is he, he is uh, he is make, giving advice in circumstances, and he is uh, he. It, we'll see as we go along. I think he is speaking wisely concerning the decisions that people make. Right? Okay. Let's hang on. Let's wait till we get to the conclusion. 
I know you have a question, but I, I want to work our way through the passages till we come to the conclusion. Okay? Okay, Lee, what were you going to say? say I, it seems like he, because he doesn't have direct revelation, he's not specifically saying one way or another. Well, he's not saying, thus saith the Lord, right. but he is giving authoritative advice. Right. And he's so, it, that's right. And, and, and you'll notice as we work our way through here, he is, he is not forbidding marriage. Okay, Gordon. Right. Yeah, like when he talks about the, the when he's talking about uh, earlier on, he says, uh, uh, "I have a commandment from the Lord." He's talking. He's talking about when Jesus t spoke about marriage. Okay, we have records of that. So this no commandment is that he can't go back. Yeah. Right, but he is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we do want it. We want it. We, yeah. in other words, it, but it, but it, we have. He is. He's giving an inspired opinion. He's giving an inspired opinion. That's right. That's right. Okay, so let's move on because we want to get to the actual opinion. Okay, now I some of my questions, you know, they make sense to me when I write them down. Okay, so. <clears throat> Okay, so what general principle should govern this decision making in about marriage, verses 26 and 27? And think back to the passage we just concluded in uh, verses 21 to 24. Right, but 26 to 27 should remind you of that theme. What what is what's he instructing them to do in those uh, two verses? Not marry. Not exactly. Not exactly. To remain in the state they are in. Okay, not to be seeking to get out of uh, or to change that that status because it, of the impact it could have on your Christian service. There's a rationale for it, but his advice is that we should stay in the state that we are in. Circumstances may change that allow us or move us to uh, to to change our status, but we are not. He's not saying, "All right, now that you've." Come to Christ. All right, now this is what you need to do. Right? He's saying, let's let's serve God where we are. If God changes our circumstances, that's a different story. All right, uh, Lee. I, mean, I think kind of where he answered. I, I would say, like, to stay in that state, that means civilization. Yeah. Cease to exist. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. 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 obviously. There was a group, uh, Norman Burgess used to tell us when he did some Bible studies for us about uh, the group in England called the Muggletonians. And the Muggletonians, uh, taught that you should not marry. And, of course, that did not lead to the increase of their group. <laughs> and it finally came down to there were two of them left, two old guys. And then they died, and there's no more Muggletonians. So I always thought that was quite amusing. And obviously, so given the, I mean, God, the creation mandate says, uh, you know, go forth and multiply and so forth, and that has not been abrogated. But what Paul is teaching is, that we need to think through our circumstances, and our first priority is serving God. And so we need to think about it in that context. All right, so let me... Um, yeah, uh, next question. If someone nevertheless chooses to marry, does Paul condemn them? Verse 28. No, absolutely not. Why? They have not sinned. Okay. Uh, now, but he does warn them about something. What does he say? You will have. You will have troubles in this life. There are troubles that you that you will have because you are married. That you wouldn't have if you were single. Okay, that's that is and that is true. Now that's not wrong. It's not wrong to have those troubles. But he's he's saying, and he's also this overriding concern, thinking we are near the end, we are facing persecution, and there. By the way, there may have been some particular stress in Corinth or in the Roman Empire at that time that Paul is aware of thinking you know we need to be serving God and, and preaching the gospel it's more important than you know carrying on with with life normal life all right so Lee and he may not have said it directly but he may have like maybe revelation or something Holy Spirit direction about the upcoming persecution in Rome that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's certain concerns, and uh, you know, there's a often um, there are stories of of men who went to war in Second World War, 
And, uh, you know, they were heading off, but many got married just before they left. Because, you know, they'd been involved with a girl and they wanted to get married, and so they married just before they left, went off to war, and left a young widow. And su subsequent problems. So he said, you know, would it have been better for them? You know, was, was that the wisest thing for them to do? See? That's a, you know, uh, in the... So in the midst of a great calamity, it may be wiser to wait, in other words, and to hold off. But he says, but he says, if you marry, you have not sinned. Okay, he's, he's not condemning marriage. All right, so um, verses 29 to 31 then, the rest of this section. What should be the overriding philosophy of life for a Christian? What should they be, how should they approach life? So the last three verses here. Uh, Aggie. Probably they should remain focused even while still everything is going on. They should remain focused on God and live their life like He still has it. That's right. Be focused on the Lord. And he mentioned specifically things like if you have troubles, you know, well, you're going to have to forget your troubles. You know, those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. You know, you have wonderful things happening. That Don't let that distract you. Those who buy as though they did not possess. How many of you do that? You know, you go buy a thing. Okay. You know, do you, do you love that new thing? You know, it's yours. Okay. This is a struggle for us. Those things, those, those possessions, those who use the world as though they do not make full use of it. In other words, that we need to be focused on serving the Lord, even though we are in the midst of a, maybe we have prosperity and we're able to, uh, to make our home nice and all of these things, but that shouldn't be the sole focus of our life. The sole focus of our life, the primary thing that we're doing is to reach others and serve the Lord. That's what he's saying. Okay? All right, Lee, were you going to say something? Well, I see, like, uh, yeah, with the marriage, with the family obligations and stuff, but it's easy, well, easier to make the mental decision that the, the heavenly or spiritual things become secondary. It almost like trying to save something. That's right. It does. Uh, the spiritual things can become secondary. I do think in our culture these days, uh, this is a pastor now taking his uh, uh, soapbox out, you know, have children, and you want them to be involved in sports, and guess what happens? Very soon, on a certain day of the week, Sunday games, that's right, what do you do? Okay, so we told the coaches they're not going to be there on Sunday. Okay, and uh, it is... Uh, you know, it, the the pressure, the world is going to put pressure on you to lose your focus from the Lord. Okay? So, we encourage people to, you know, first the Lord, then the other stuff. Okay? All right. Let's see. Let's move on to the next paragraph. Okay? And I guess I'll read that. I'll get these things out again. They're not as good as the other ones, and I don't like them anyway. Okay, so, but I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. So what would you say Paul is doing here in these verses, the theme of these verses? Whatever you do, put God first. Whatever you do, put God first. Okay, that's absolutely the general theme. That's his goal, right? Right, uh, Tola? Also, he was falling off what Jesus Christ said, that if you love my mother, wife, mother, me. Yes. Yes, yeah, right. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? That's exactly the same perspective, isn't it? All right. And so he's he is clarifying a little bit about what he said. Why is he saying that? You know, think about whether or not you should marry right now because of the present distress, because the time is short, and so forth. Think about this. What? Evaluate whether you should make this decision. All right. So. So what does he have what concern does he have for either husbands or wives? So this is verses 33 and 34b. What are the concerns that he has for them uh, about 
um, uh, what marriage will mean for them. Their interests are divided, or potentially divided, potentially divided, okay? And so, on the other hand, what is the advantage of singleness? So, verse 32 and 34a. Undistracted devotion to the Lord, Lord, that's right. And so, uh, uh, and it is, uh, so uh, his ultimate goal, then, the last question, what is Paul's ultimate goal in giving these instructions? Verse, uh, the verse 35, What's he, what is he after? We've already said it, but I want to hear it again. Okay, devotion to the Lord. Okay, so those who are married obviously have concerns that they have to deal with in marriage. You have kids, you have sick kids, you have clothes they need, they keep growing. You know, you get them new shoes and two months later you get them new shoes. And then, again, another two months, you know, there's certain stages of life, you know, like, why don't you go barefoot, you know, (laughs) okay, but, uh, okay, so there are distractions, you know, uh, with with our kids, we were uh, using the, we were using a homeschool curriculum that was quite pricey, and we didn't have any money, Uh, I mean, that that is a distraction, but, uh, and a burden, so he's saying, now, these are the things that you have to think about. And he's he's saying this to put it uh, uh, for our own benefit, but notice, but not to put a restraint on you. He's saying, I'm not saying don't marry, but I want you to think about it. I want you to put Jesus first. That's the objective that he has in in when you're considering the question of marriage. The marriage itself is a blessing. It is from God, and it, it is not a sin. It is actually a, a, a normal and a pro- appropriate way to live, but that marriage should be have as its focus serving God. That's ultimately what he's saying, that we should together be serving God, and then the decisions that we are making and the problems that we face are under are submitted to that objective. All right. I think that's ultimately his philosophy. The other thing that he's teaching us throughout this chapter is we should not think of singleness as a, um, you know, there's something wrong with that guy. You know, he's, you know, that's why he's not married. He's a little weird. Or she's a little weird. Okay. Well, circumstances can happen. And so we trust the Lord for whatever happens. Okay. And, and in the meantime, we serve the Lord. That's our goal is to serve the Lord. Okay. We're going to move. Oh, yes. Question. Sure. Yes. Well, his emphasis is because he said you'll notice in the, those phrases because of the present distress, because of the time is short, uh, because there is trouble. He says, "I am advising you to try to help you so that you." Uh, keep your focus on serving the Lord. He is not forbidding them to marry, but he is cautioning them about the decision that they make. And I think, um, uh, and, he's, and he's also wanting to po- make um, the point that's, that it is, it is appropriate and legitimate to serve, the God, serve God as a single person. Okay? Now, he, but he, I don't think he is... He, I, he's not speaking against marriage, but he is speaking for wisdom and for serving God. Okay, and um, uh, I guess that's that's the best I can do at this point. Lee, it seems like it would be easy to come to conclusion that he is kind of casting a shadow. Yeah, so you can take you can see that, but I think that the way to understand it is because he keeps saying, "I'm not putting a restraint on you." Uh, he says about marriage, "They have not sinned. They have not." It is, it, is, it is right and fine. But you do, especially in a time of pressure, you have to take this into consideration. There are, there are concerns. All right, Augustine. I think my interpretation is like, I mean, for those that are married, you need to balance it. To yes. To ensure that you are not carried away by the world or by the things you are engaging. That's right. And that if you now keep, if you tilt in the direction of the world too much, now you're offending 
the provisions of what God has commanded. That's right. So it means if you have, you can devote, but just ensure you balance it well. That's right. I, that's exactly right. I agree with that. <laughs> you said it better than I did. <laughs> okay, I hope that got picked up on the mics. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll maybe I'll have to go back and edit that part and boost the volume so that we get your 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 answer in there. Okay, so let's move on to the next section, and this is uh, verse thirty-two. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned with the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned with the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord. Uh, wait a minute, that, that's the one we just did, isn't it? I must have two of those. Okay, here we go. Verse 36. Uh, but if any man thinks that he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, if she is past her youth, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let her marry. But he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will, and has decided this in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, he will do well. So then, both he who gives his own virgin daughter in marriage does well, and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. Now before we, uh, well let's, um, let's uh, what, is this, what is the theme of this section, first of all, before we go on to some explanations? The unmarried, but the unmarried, yes, but who, which particular ones? Fathers with, daughters. fathers with daughters. What are they going to do about this question? Because it is the father who decides whether that girl can get married or not. Okay. Now, uh, I do want to note a couple of things here. Now, first of all, you'll notice that in this, in all of these verses, the word daughter is in italics. So, what does that tell you? It's not in the Greek. It's not in the it's not in the King James. Oh, Gordon, <laughs> you you're you're gonna have to do you're gonna have to do some hail marys. I'm telling you. I mean, until I see this, I didn't. I honestly didn't realize it. Okay. Now, does anybody have an N, Does anybody here have an NIV? And they're like, okay, Marlena, what does the NIV say? Why don't you read? The, do you have it right handy? Well, I'll, I'll wait for you to get it. Once you get there, you I want to show you a difference here. Okay, so there is, there is now, the, uh, in the King James, it leaves it off. It says, if he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin, if she is past her youth, and so on. It just leaves the word off. Okay, then the NIV says it slightly differently. Uh, verse 36 is good. Okay, so what's the interpretation that the NIV is giving there? That's right, potential husband and wife. Okay, so it's a couple. So the word daughter is not in there. Now, this is the one verse, this is the one passage that Bible scholars sort of really go after the NIV. Okay, because they think that they've, well many, not all of them, obviously those who, scholars who support the NIV think that's okay. <laughs> okay, but this is the one place because because uh, the the Greek is somewhat ambiguous, uh, because it doesn't specifically say daughter. It says, if any man thinks that he's acting unbecomingly toward his virgin. So the assumption is, uh, the, the interpretation is that this is fathers and daughters. Okay? Uh, it seems to me in the context that that fits the the... the the language of both verses, verse 36 and 37, better than the idea of being a couple. Okay? Gordon? Well, as I said, like, I read the King James, and I assumed that it meant with the NIV. Oh, really? I've just never heard anything different. Really? But Interesting. That makes way more sense. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, so so there is a bit of a debate. I only bring it up because you know there is a bit of, of debate amongst Christians about this. Okay, I think either way, it's tr it it you you can you could make a point from either rendering of it. However, given that the culture has to do with the fathers approving uh, the marriage of their daughters, I do think that that is 
more consistent, a more consistent interpretation with what, what we have here. All right, so, um, uh, so the question I have in this section is, in general, whether a father gives his daughter in marriage or not, does Paul indicate he has sinned in either case? Okay, no. Or if it's a couple, have they sinned in getting married? No. Okay. So the point, that, the only thing that I want you to see in this, I did want to bring this up because to show you that there is a little bit of a difference of interpretation. But the bottom line is that Paul is stating that marriage is well, good and singleness is also good. Now he thinks because of the present distress that it is better to remain single at that time. But he is not making that a universal principle. Okay, that's what I would have to say. All right, any, um, let's move on to the last section. I'm watching my clock as well. So let's do this one. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But in my opinion, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I also have the Spirit of God. So what is he talking about? What is the theme in this section? Uh, James. Being a widow? Being a widow, okay? The, th the question of marriage for widows, okay? So there is only one restriction that Paul gives for the married. What is that? Or for those who marry, what is that restriction in verse uh, 39? If your husband dies? Not, not if their husband dies. What, that's, that's the condition. What is the restriction? Oh, okay, someone in the faith. Only in the Lord. Now, we, we will uh, teach... That, that Christian singles should only, in fact, I will extrapolate even further, Christian singles should only date Christian singles, whether they're widows or widowers, whether they're you know, young people, virgins, uh, they should only date Christian singles. We often hear this refrain from people who are lonely, and they're being seen with a Christian girl or a Christian guy being seen with a non-Christian of the opposite sex. Oh, we're just friends. My wife says, who do you think you marry, enemies? <laughs> that comes later. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay? Okay, but here's the deal. From this verse and other principles in the scripture, we teach that you should be very restrictive in whom you form close personal relationships with, with a view towards marriage. Lee? Yeah, well, he uses the term unequally yoked. We apply that yeah. often to marriage. It applies in many other uh, situations. But yes, that is certainly, that is a great, is a great burden. Now, some people, of course, uh, you know, maybe they became Christians later in life. Maybe they didn't follow this advice when they were younger. And, and as, all, as we always say, we were younger and foolisher, now we're older and wiser, hopefully. But, but so you are in a state, some people are in a state where they have an unchristian spouse. Well, God isn't saying, as we saw already in this passage, in earlier, in the, he says, he's not saying, okay, well, divorce them. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, all right, stay in the state you're in. Okay, but... If you are single, do not make the mistake of entering into a marriage relationship with somebody who is not a believer. Okay? So the way to prevent that, in, in my view, this is not scripture, but this is, this is the, the uh, uh, spiritual instructions according to Don Johnson, is don't date unbelievers. Okay? It's just you're, you're asking for trouble. Okay. All right. So that's a little extra. All right, so then the last thing, in keeping with his chapter-long theme, what does Paul advocate in verse 40? For the widow. It's better if she stays. It's better if she stays single. That's right, it's better if she stays the way she is. Now, in, um, uh, let's see, Timothy... There's a passage where he talks about those who are widows indeed, okay, and the care of the church for those who are widows indeed. But he also says for those who are younger widows in that passage, he does want them to be mar to marry. So, so there is, some people will say, oh, he's con contradicting himself. Well, it depends on the category. 
And he does think that those who, are, that who, who have means, who are able to some way to take care of themselves, it would be better for them just to serve the Lord as they are and, and to trust the Lord with their life and not, not get married. All right, Lee. I never noticed this before, but in verse 40, he's saying, according to my judgment, but isn't that looking like no, what he's saying is that this is my opinion, and he also thinks that he has, uh, that God, God is, agrees with him. Okay, the Spirit agrees with him. And since it was kept in Scripture, we accept this as inspired Scripture. Sure. Yeah. Uh, an it is an interesting way of putting it. But he is saying, okay, this, I ha again, he's, he's emphasizing, these are my opinions, but I do think, I, he says, I have, I'm an apostle, and I think I have the Spirit of God. And because God preserved it, we believe he, he did. So this is wisdom for answering the question about marriage. Now, we are now 2,000 years, roughly, from the time when Paul was writing these words. Obviously, even though there was a present distress, and even though we are in the last days, we have not come yet to the final days. So, uh, Christian young people, Christian singles... You know, Christian families need to make wise decisions. And uh, we endorse marriage. We had one here. Uh, well, how long, how long is it now, James? Exactly one week. Exactly one week. <laughs> so praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, so I thought you'd be kind of knew the exact number of days and hours. I'm just glad I remember. <laughs> You're just glad you remember. <laughs> okay, well, you were counting down probably, but not counting up afterwards. Okay, but anyway, but we're, we endorse it. We want... Christians to marry one another, but the uh, but Paul is also giving us a perspective of wisdom concerning uh, when somebody's circumstances are in singleness that they should first focus on serving the Lord and that they should um, uh, not uh, 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 be so obsessed with getting marriage that they start making that the sole focus of their life. I, I've known people who are, that was the thing they were just pushing, 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 and I have often said to them, there are a whole lot worse things in life than never having been married. Okay, so it is, it, we need to walk with the Lord and trust Him in all these matters. I have a couple of quotes that I want to close with. They're in your notes if you've got your sheet. The first one comes from Gordon Fee. One of the unfortunate things that has happened to this text in the church is that the very pastoral concern of Paul that caused him to express himself in this way has been a source of anxiety rather than comfort. Part of the reason for this is that in Western cultures we do not generally live in a time of present distress. Thus we fail to sense the kind of care that this text represents. Beyond that, what is often heard is that Paul prefers singleness to marriage, which he does. But quite in contrast to Paul's own position over against the Corinthians, we often read into that preference that singleness is somehow a superior status. That causes some who do not wish to remain single to become anxious about God's will in their lives. Such people need to hear it again. Marriage or singleness per se lies totally outside the category of commandments to be obeyed or sin if one indulges. And Paul's preference here is not predicated on spiritual grounds, but on pastoral concern. It is perfectly all right to marry. And so I think that's a good sum summary of what is being said. And then uh, one from Constable. Paul undoubtedly knew that he represented the mind of God in what he said. He simply expressed himself as he did in order to avoid laying too much weight on his own preference. Okay, so these are things to help us think this through. It, it is a challenging passage. The bottom line, I think, in terms of marriage is that marriage is God's idea, that God... Uh, that, that God does want Christians to marry Christians, that God does not want anyone to get a divorce if they can at all avoid it. Now, some, you know, some, in our world, it's not always avoidable. That God uh, wants us to be content where we are and whatever we are doing to serve him faithfully, to put him first. That is the goal. And you know, whatever terrible experiences we've had in the past, God takes us where we are now, and he wants us to serve him going forward. And, you know, even when we are the ones that have made mistakes, it, it's, uh, it's uh, God will take us and redeem us and uh, use us in his service. All right, let's close with a word of prayer, and we'll be finished for, for this session. Father, we thank you for this word. We pray for your blessing 
on our study of the scriptures and may it uh, speak to us and guide us, give us wisdom and help us to make wise decisions for us and our families going forward in Jesus name. Amen. So next week we have a, a non-controversial subject, meat offered to idols. <laughs> so, nobody has any problems with that one, do you? Okay, so we'll find out all about that next time.